Today we're going to talk about genome editing using the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Okay, so recently Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier received the Nobel Prize for developing this system. So please watch the Doudna video first, where she explains the origins of this amazing system. So CRISPR is a form of immune system present in bacteria. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Spaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Okay, so what these are, are DNA memories of previous phage or foreign invaders. So um, these will be transcribed into a guide that can then recognize complementary DNA later and destroy it. So it's a pr protection against viruses, basically, based on the fact that that cell or its progenitor cells have seen that virus before. So this diagram is what a typical CRISPR system looks like um, in a prokaryotic cell. Now there are many different prokaryotes that have CRISPR systems, so this is just a general schematic of what a lot of them are like. Okay, so the idea is what the CRISPR locus is. It's made of a series of repeats of the little black triangle looking square things are a repeat of a particular sequence common, well, that goes across the CRISPR locus, punctuated by these little different color squares where the different colors represent DNA sequences that are actually homologous to viruses. Small bits of viral DNA has been captured and inserted into the CRISPR locus because those viruses were seen before and now we want to protect ourselves against future viruses of the same type. So the CRISPR locus is transcribed um, into RNA and then it is processed into the individual um, active forms of the CRISPR RNA. Now this is a little bit schematized because there's another RNA that also associates with these called the tracer RNA. So the active one contains the CRISPR RNA itself as well as the tracer RNA. But importantly, each little CRISPR bit contains a so-called spacer sequence, which is what's going to target the CRISPR RNA and the associated Cas protein to the DNA, which we want to break, create double strand breaks at. So that's going to be the target. So represented here is this virus. These viruses are trying to invade the cell, but the cell has CRISPR repeats that are homologous to bits of those viruses. So the CRISPR repeat along with the Cas protein associates with those DNAs, makes double strand breaks, thereby inactivating the virus. So the schematic of this is you have the, the, the beige glob in the back re represents the Cas9 protein, which is a nuclease. Well, it actually has two distinct nuclease activities. And we're shown that the double-stranded DNA has been separated or unwound to make the two strands available for target site cleavage. We have the guide RNA, which is complementary to the DNA at the place where you want to cut. And then the scissors indicate the locations approximately of the double-strand DNA break that's going to result from these guide-directed Cas9 nuclease activity on this particular target. Um, one other feature to this is called the protospacer proto adjacent motif, motif or PAM. That there are some constraints as to what you can actually chop and where. You need to have this NGG PAM sequence adjacent to the target sequence that you want to cut. But that's other other CRISPR systems use different protospacers, so that's not a major constraint. And certainly there are plenty of GG dinucleotides around all over the place. So it's important to realize that there's one RNA that you can make, that the tracer RNA has been built into the vector, and you can engineer it to include your guide. So it's a very simple matter to make one of these um, in a test tube and, and use it to guide um, double strand and break anywhere that you want, any, in any DNA that you want to be cut. There are many applications of this. Remember again, cluster regular layer, the, say CRISPR is easier. Cas is a CRISPR-9, CRISPR-associated protein. The organism from which these are derived is um, S. pyogenes, but there are other CRISPR systems in other organisms as well. Right, the guide RNA is a synthetic molecule in the lab at least, and includes a fusion between the two bacterial RNAs 
as well as the chosen so-called spacer. Now, the spacer is a strange misnomer because that's actually the, the target, targeting sequence, which is going to guide the RNA and protein to the re region that we want to cut. I mentioned this protospacer adjacent motif. So that's not actually part of the spacer. It has to be in the genomic DNA that's adjacent to the region that you want to cut. So what happens is if you find your target sequence and the two strands are broken and then the cell actually takes over to find out what's going to happen next in terms of our genome editing. But we've got a fair bit of control over this as well. Okay, so what you end up with is a double strand break. The cell wants to fix a double strand break because that's going to be lethal. And there are two natural pathways that are most commonly used in the cell. One is called the non-homologous end joining pathway. And as a result of this activity of this pathway, you end up usually deleting or inserting a few nucleotides at the side of the break. Now this will knock out your gene if it occurs in an essential exon. And the other is homology dependent repair. And this will occur if the cell has either artificially or naturally a donor DNA that can be used as a template to repair by resynthesizing the region. Now, experimentally, when one wants to use homology-directed repair, one simply provides synthetic oligonucleotide, oligonucleotides or PCR products that will contain the region of interest and serve as a template for um, basically cutting and repairing that particular region. All right. So double-strand breaks are very dangerous to the cell, and we have a lot of proteins that will detect and fix them. So the CRISPR is used to make the cut, and then the cell is going to fix them for us, and that's going to result in genome editing. Okay, so this is non-homologous end joining. It is mutagenic because after the break, in this case designated by the little lightning bolt, such as would happen during you know UV mutagenesis or something, that the DNA is broken at that location, usually leaving some staggered ripped ends. So that needs to be repaired. And there's a whole host of cellular proteins that contribute to that process, including polymerases, nucleases, ligases, et cetera. But the upshot of that type of repair is that you end up either adding, usually deleting, adding or deleting a few nucleotides at the site of repair. So this particular um, mutation, this particular double strand break was in this instance repaired essentially in four different ways to give four different mutants which either gain or lose a few nucleotides at, at the site of the break. But those are all mutagenic, because if that happened to be in the middle of an exon, that would knock out the exon, and therefore probably knock out the gene if it's a well-chosen exon. So lots of times CRISPR just does that. It simply is the idea you're going to mutate your gene in a specific sort of way. OK. So of course, we have a lot of proteins that do this. And there's more than one potential outcome of a double strand break that's repaired by this. But the idea is that anything that, it, well, you pick the region where you want the break to be, where you want the repair to be. So those are chosen to disrupt the gene if they occur in the exon. So non-homologous end joining is depicted on the left-hand part of this slide, illustrated. You've got your break, and you've got to have some chewing and adding and repairing that goes on to lead to a patch of DNA, which is likely to give a gene disruption. So the red patch indicates the location where nucleotides have been generally deleted, messed with, to knock out the exon. And that's perfectly fine for a lot of reasons. But lots of times, what you really want to do is to change the sequence in a specific sort of way, either to, to correct a mutation that you don't like, or to just replace that section of the DNA with something else entirely. So for that, you need the homologous recombination repair pathway provided by PCR products or oligonucleotides that you provide to the cell. So if we provide a double-strand DNA that's homologous to the region, the cell will then replace that. It will use that PCR product to essentially replace the broken region with the sequence from the double-strand DNA. Now, the homology only has to be on the actual ends of the PCR product. What's in the middle can be actually anything. But the result will be the same. 
that the DNA that you're providing will be used to replace what's there at the, at the, well, near, at or near the side of the brain. So this ends up being a gene replacement, really, in which the homology donor sequence replaces what was there and also fixes the double-strand break at the same time. So this is a very, very, very useful trick. So that's the picture here. We made our double-strand break. We're going to provide a homology repair template as shown here. Homologous recombination basically takes that repair DNA template and uses it to replace, in a complicated sort of way, um, the, the DNA that was present in the region flanking the break. So this is a gene addition, or it can be a gene addition, or it can be a gene repair if we want to have a, if there's a mutation in there that we want to get rid of. So engineers' CRISPR systems can hunt down their complementary sequences, make double-strand cuts, and this has become huge because it permits precise and efficient genome editing in cell lines. And if you've got a diploid cell, generally both alleles will be fixed and also has been used in whole organisms to a not quite as extensive, but greater extent than you would think. Okay, so it sounds like fine in principle, but we have to be able to get this into cells in a way that's going to do what we want, which is to fix something or um, re just make a mutation in something. So in terms of delivering of the CRISPR system to cells, there's a lot of different ways that people have chosen to do it. One thing, you can just give the cells the Cas9 um, guide RNA complex as a protein RNA complex. People use plasmids that will then produce the RNA and protein in the cell. And other things that we won't talk about are delivery by viruses. So it's a simple matter conceptually to create a molecule either in vitro by producing the RNA and protein and delivering that into a cell or making a plasmid that will then produce the RNA and protein, and that will deliver it for you. Okay, this is schematically depicted here. Here is a Cas9 guide RNA complex, and it has, goes into the cell, makes its way to the nucleus, where it then finds its genomic target and cuts it. The other plasmid delivery idea is that you give the cell a plasmid, which is capable of creating the Cas9 protein RNA, which will then get translated, and the guide RNA, which will then associate with the Cas9, and that will go into the nucleus where it will cut the genomic target. Now, this sounds like incredibly difficult, but it, it actually is not, surprisingly. Okay, so in terms of gene delivery, gene therapy's always had gene delivery as its Achilles heel, and that's still true. In cell lines, this is a very simple, actually, way to do things, that there's different ways to get stuff into cells. For example, electroporation is a process whereby the cell is subjected to electric shock, and that causes transient holes to appear in the membrane, and that allows entry by some mysterious process of proteins and nucleic acids into the cell. Now, the Cas9s that are used for humans are, have been engineered to contain a nuclear localization signal that works in mammalian cells. So that will then go to the nucleus again and it will hunt down its complementary DNA and cut it. Other ideas are you can encapsulate your um, protein RNA complex in a lipid, lipid particle, which will then be taken up by endocytosis, escape from the endosome, and then itself get it into the nucleus. There's other more complicated ways in which this can work. Now, it's hard to imagine that it's actually much easier to get DNA into mammalian cells than it is to get the DNA into either bacteria or yeast cells, because we don't have cell walls, and that makes it a lot easier for the DNA to get in. So electroporation, I just mentioned, the cells are given an electric shock, and this gives a fairly efficient way, which is still mysterious, of getting DNA, mostly nucleic acids, into cells. A process called transfection um, is most commonly used, actually, where the cells are treated with a reagent that also causes the membrane to become more permeable. DNA and proteins can get in easily. Lipid nanoparticles, same as before, and also viral media, viral vectors are much more complicated to use, so we'll save that for the next course. The point is that if you have mammalian cells in culture, it's a very easy matter to get DNA or, and or proteins into them. 
in, in some fairly easy, um, easy and not very expensive sorts of ways. And as far as the Cas9 is concerned, people will often, you can buy the Cas9 protein, but it's expensive. So many labs are actually purify their own Cas9 protein. And then, um, and that's not too difficult either. You, of course, have to guide, you have to design your own guide RNAs. Um, but once you've got that, you can either buy it or transcribe it easily from purified DNA templates. So that's not a hard thing to do. So some labs choose to uh, purify the Cas9 protein, purify the guide RNA, and then incubate them together where they dissociate and then transfect them. And that's not a difficult process. The plasmids that are used for this process, you still have to cut and paste your molecules in E. coli like usual. So you need a plasmid vector with, origins that, with an origin that works in E. coli plus some selection. You need to have sites for cloning purposes, etc. But this is a fairly standard type of cloning reaction where anybody with any lab experience can actually do this fairly easily. So in fact, many, many vectors are so sold for this purpose. Here's a Cas9 smart nuclease vector where this protein, um, it encodes the Cas9 gene. So that goes into a mammalian cell. It's got a mammalian promoter. It will produce the Cas9 protein in, in the cell. And it has a region where you can clone in your little piece, teeny piece of DNA that's going to contain the guide RNA that you want. So these are, you know, not too expensive. A lot of people use them. So this is what it looks like. Finally, you've got your guide RNA and the vector encoded um, trace of RNA built in. And then this will go easily into cells by either electroporation, transfection, or whatever. Okay, so what do we want to edit? Recent famous examples for human gene therapy, because that's what everybody really wants to do with this. There are about a gazillion applications right now, and everybody is crispering everything, really. But the direct application to human disease is something that's on everybody's radar. Everybody's really, really interested in seeing how this works. So the sickle cell allele of the hemoglobin locus has been a major target for this kind of effort, because of par partly because the disease is so common, it's not a rare disease at all. Um, but different approaches have been used, um, and, and some are more advanced than others. Now, the most advanced one is kind of an oblique, unusual application of this idea to basically reverse the effect of the sickle cell allele, not just um, fix it directly, but give, it, give the cell a, a alternative to hemoglobin F, which will essentially reverse the effects of the uh, mutant hemoglobin. Okay, this sounds strange, but it works. There's a genetic syndrome called hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. And this creating this disease in people's cells is, is, go, is use, being used as a trick treatment for sickle cell disease. So what happens here in mammals, there are different hemoglobin beta chains made at different times during your life. There's one, some for embryonic and for fetal, and then after birth, adult. So it's the adult form of the beta chain that's a problem with the sickle cell allele, not the fetal one. The fetal one is perfectly normal. Problems only arise after birth when the mutant hemoglobin gives trouble. So each of these genes is silenced and activated in turn as development goes on. And usually the fetal form is turned off at or, at or near the time of birth to be replaced by the adult form, which is activated at that time. So in hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, the switch does not occur, and the fetal form persists throughout life. So the early attempts or the ongoing attempts to fix or treat or cure the sickle cell disease is basically to re recreate or create this syndrome in the person with the disease. Okay, so what this looks like, the fetal hemoglobin persists early, but on Around the time of birth, it goes away, it's shut, the gene is shut off, and the adult form of the beta hemoglobin is activated. All right, so in terms of the um, fetal hemoglobin, people with hereditary persistence of hemoglobin don't do the shut off. They turn on their adult hemoglobin, but the fetal hemoglobin remains. 
and they are just fine. There's no disease associated with this particular genetic variation. And it had been noticed that people with this syndrome, if they also have the sickle cell allele, have very mild, sim mild symptoms of it in the rare instances when those occur together. So the idea is to create the hereditary persistent situation in people and see how it works. Well, it's known that it works in cells. What this graph shows is if you have um, hemoglobin F increasing on the um, in a log scale on the x-axis, the higher the level of the fetal hemoglobin, the less the effects are, um, or let's say morbidities, um, in the case that when, when there's sickle cell alleles around. So the what that's saying is the more fetal hemoglobin you have, the less severe the sickle cell symptoms are. So this gives a encouraging idea here that if you have enough fetal hemoglobin, even if the sickle cell allele is still present, that the symptoms will be mitigated. There'll be much less severe disease. Okay, so how to create these mutations? Different groups have tried different ways, but the major answer seems to be a repressor called BCL11, which is a repressor that is responsible for the shutoff at the time of birth. So what happens is it, repress it binds to a promoter region adjacent to the fetal hemoglobin genes, shutting them off. So that's one thing you want to do, is get rid of the binding site for the repressor, and therefore the repressor won't be able to bind, and the fetal form will persist. The other approach people have used is use CRISPR to mutate the promoter enhancer region of the BCL repressor itself, the one that's active in blood cells. So if there's no BCL11, there will be no, no repression, and the fetal form will persist. That's the idea. Another approach, which is not quite so far advanced quite yet, is just to go ahead and fix the mutation using CRISPR with a homology-dependent repair template, simply to replace the mutant region with a wild-type one, which makes sense, actually. The reason that people are preferring the other method, though, is if the fetal hemoglobin thing works, it would work for other mutations in the beta globin uh, protein, not just the sickle cell allele. But we'll see how this works. The trials in progress so far, um, th this has not advanced quite as much as the persistence of hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin has, but th that looks encouraging also. In terms of getting it into people, this is an example of what's called an ex vivo approach as opposed to in vivo, where you like give somebody the virus carrying the, the gene or whatever. So the ex vivo approach means you harvest cells from the individual, manipulate them in a culture tube or in a um, tissue culture situation, and then reinfuse them into the person. So in this ex vivo approach, what's been done is the stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, are collected from the person, and they're then they're isolated and then manipulated with the CRISPR system in a tissue culture situation. So here the CRISPR-Cas9 was delivered as a protein RNA complex via electroporation. The cells are allowed to grow out, out a little bit and then tested to make sure that the editing went as desired and that the cells are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. Okay, then after the edited cells have been tested, they are then reinfused into the person where it is hoped that they will engraft into the bone marrow, mature into stem into blood cells, and produce the desired fetal as well as normal beta hemoglobin. So this is a long and drawn out and very difficult procedure for the patient. But from what I understand, people are very happy with it, those that have had it already. All right, so in terms of whether this works, um, I don't understand what this green bar is, but the idea is at the beginning, before the infusion, CTX001 is, is the name of the CRISPR-Cas9 formulation, that the hemoglobin was um, almost all the hemoglobin S, which is a sickle cell form, and that after infusion into the people, the samples were collected over time, and the different forms of hemoglobin that were present were analyzed. So over time, the blue bar 
indicates the fetal hemoglobin, so it is generally increasing over time and remaining stable over at least nine months. And of course, the fetal um, hemoglobin S is still present, but in roughly equal proportion to the fetal hemoglobin, which is now a very significant part of the hemoglobin. So the question, does this work? Does this mitigate the symptoms? This essentially makes the person, um, a person with sickle cell trait, essentially heterozygous for the sickle cell mutation. So it's not like it's gone away, but it should be mitigated to the point of being more like the trait and not the actual disease. Now, the first patient um, had been requiring about five blood transfusions each year and had various, several occlusion crises regularly. And so she was in not great shape at all. In the nine months after one infusion, one of the modified cells, she had no crisis at all and did not require any blood transfusions. So the expanded study was 50, about 50 people is ongoing, but the results from those are encouraging as well. So this is certainly an effective treatment for the disease or certainly appears that way and can actually be regarded as a cure since the modified cells are expected to colonize the bone marrow and remain there for the life of the person. So this is truly good news for everybody that knows anyone with this disease.